We're glad you're here, and if you're one of the friends or family that are visiting with us this morning, we hope you'll be back as often as you can. We know we've even got some folks from out of town, and we hope that you'll be back with us uh, every opportunity that you have. Uh, a lot of good things going on at Clear Creek, and uh, we're excited about the work that's here. Uh, we hope that if you're friends or family, you'll stick around uh, to uh, allow us to get to know you. We'll have a dinner afterwards. Jake will be giving you specifics on that after services are over. Uh, we're starting a, ser a sermon series today uh, entitled The Perfectly Imperfect Family. Uh, we'll preach it today. Next week I will not be here. David Skidmore from North Boulevard Church will be here uh, in my place. And uh, then the next two weeks after that we'll finish up this series, The Perfectly Imperfect Family. So as we go launch into this service, let's pray together. God, we thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your goodness, and for your grace. We come here because we adore you and we want to lift you up, and we thank you for being a father worthy of being called father. And, and Lord, as we enter into this service and we talk about family, may we realize that you apply grace to all of our families. For there is no perfect family. We're truly perfectly imperfect. And Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and his sacrifice that gives us blessing, it gives us hope, it gives us courage. And in that blessing, we also find eternity. And it's in his name we pray. And amen. Yeah, that's a dirty trick to play on you on Friends and Family Morning. Some of you probably put mascara on. The truth is, as much as we would like for all families to be perfect and ideal, the best most of us can do, really the best all of us can do, is to try and be that perfectly imperfect family. We all have our stuff. And maybe you're from a great family and a happy family, and, and that's wonderful, and, and you are incredibly blessed. But whether you're from a great family and a happy family, or maybe you're from a family that your memories are painful, or you have this feeling of chaos within your family, or maybe you grew up in a family where there was little to no affirmation of who you are and, and what you mean to your, your parents or your siblings. Maybe you feel wounded. There's a lot of different stories when it comes to family because all families are different. And that's what makes talking about family, especially in a group like this, a group this large, uh, talking about family becomes very difficult because every family is different. When you mention the words father or mother or sister or brother, Sometimes those bring up these great images, but sometimes they bring up images that are painful. They reopen wounds. They come with stories and baggage. And the truth is, we all have our stuff. There are several things that families have in common. First, everyone in here is part of a family. Some family, extended family, something, you're part of a family. And if you're a Christian, you're definitely part of a family because you are part of the family of God. The second thing that's true of families is we rarely, if ever, get to choose our family. We're born into a family, and, and I was telling in the class this morning, I grew up in a family that uh, uh, very often I kind of wanted to be in someone else's family. It was kind of tough in my family at times. And I had a friend named Robert, and it's like his dad was cool, his mom was pretty, everything seemed to be great at their, their house, and I wanted to be part of that family. But what I didn't know is that 10 years later, that family would explode. There's pain in every family. The third thing that's true is that we're always the smartest person in our family, aren't we? You're the smartest person in your family because, you know, you look around and you say, well, if they would just do this or if they would just be this way, we could fix all these problems and this would be a perfect situation. But the reality in there is that all families, in some way or another, have to admit it, we're jacked up. Now, if you're one of those families, whether you have a great family and a happy family, or your family is marked with, with wounds and scars and chaos, 
I want to let you know that we're going to study a family over my next three sermons here that's going to make you feel a lot better about you. Truth is, in Scripture, there are almost no traditional, ideal, perfect families. We have families like Adam and Eve, where he chooses a woman over God. We have Abraham and his story. We have uh, uh, Jacob and his story. We have, uh, even with Jesus' family, his family came to grab him one time because they thought he was crazy. We have almost no examples of ideal families. But what we do have examples of are faithful families. And that's where we're going to start. So if your family's weird, the biblical family we're going to talk about is going to make you feel a lot better. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about Isaac's family. I don't know how familiar you are with Isaac in the Old Testament. Isaac is the son of Abraham and Sarah. He was the child of promise. Uh, God had promised Abraham many, many years before Isaac came along that he and Sarah would have a son. And that he would be the father of many nations, and this prophecy came true eventually through Isaac. Now, Isaac goes off, and he marries this woman named Rebekah. And they have two sons. They, their sons' names are Esau and Jacob. And Esau was the oldest one. But when you read in Scripture that Esau was the oldest brother, you think that, you know, it may be like your situation. That, that Esau was maybe a couple of years older than Jacob, and he kind of picked on him. They were twins. As a matter of fact, if you read in, in the 25th and 26th chapter of Genesis, you'll see that uh, these twins, even in the womb, fought each other. They were, they were at battle with one another from the time of conception. But when they came out, Esau came out first, and he was the firstborn son. Now, in this culture, firstborn meant everything because there was a blessing of the firstborn. Basically, the father loved and trained the firstborn. The rest of the children were just kids. But that firstborn was really, really special. It was no different in this family. Esau, the firstborn of Isaac, had all of Isaac's attention. He had all of Isaac's affirmation. He had all of Isaac's love. But then there was his brother, born minutes later, named Jacob. And he was a child that his mother loved. Well, you know in a family, if, one, if the dad chooses one child and the mother chooses another there's going to be trouble. And so we pick up our story at the end of Isaac's life. And it's time for him to give his blessing, which goes with an inheritance and comes with favor and everything else. And it's time for him to give his blessing to the firstborn, to Esau. And so in Genesis chapter 27, verses 2 through 4, we read these words in Scripture. It says, Isaac said, Behold now, I am old, and I do not know uh, the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out in the field and hunt game for me. And prepare a savory dish for me, just as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. To Esau, this son, who was a great hunter, he said, go out and kill this game that I love so much. And you know, you know how to cook it just the way I like it because you're amazing, Esau. Go kill this game. Go bring it back. And when you do, we'll sit down and we'll eat. And I will give you the affirmation that you've been waiting for. This total affirmation, this blessing that comes with it, more than just blessing but inheritance. Now, Rebecca had other ideas. As Esau gathers his gear, he goes out to hunt. Rebecca overhears what's going on, and she devises her own plan because she wants her son Jacob to have this blessing. And so we pick up the story in Genesis 27, verses 8 through 13, and we, we read this. It says, Now, therefore, my son, is, this is Rebecca speaking to Jacob, listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there. And that I may prepare them as a savory dish for your father. And look at this nigga, such as he loves. Esau's not the only one who knows how to please Isaac. Mom does too. And then she said, you bring it to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. They're going to steal the blessing. And Jacob answered his mother, Rebecca, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. And so they devised their plan. He says, perhaps my father will feel me, and then I will be a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. And her response is, your curse be on me, my son. Obey my voice 
and go and get them for me. Now she's got the plan. The blessing's about to be given. This affirmation, this love, this, this total is about to be given. And she says, okay, you go ahead and go get them. Bring them back. Don't worry about him. I can deal with him. We're going to jump in in front of Esau and receive the blessing. And the, the, the story continues in verse 14. It says, so he went and he got them. And he brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food, such as his father loved. And then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which uh, were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the young goat on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. So he also gave the savory food and the bread, which she had made, to her son Jacob. Then he came to his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Interesting. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your brother, or your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please, and sit and eat my game, that you may bless me. It's a fabulous story. We know as the story goes on that Jacob does, or Isaac does bless Jacob. He receives this blessing. Esau comes back from hunting, and he is incredibly angry. He threatens to kill Jacob. We know as the story goes on that even though Jacob receives this blessing, he leaves penniless as a sojourner uh, for the majority of his life. But all he wanted, he didn't want the wealth. He just wanted that one moment, that one blessing. I feel sorry for Esau in a way. To me, one of the most tragic parts of this story, there are two parts of the story really tragic to me, but one of the most part, tragic part of the story is that down in this chapter, in verse 38, Esau goes back to his father after the blessing has been given away. And he says this. It says, Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too. Bless me also, oh my father. And, and he lifted his voice and he wept. Can you imagine how he felt? What he thought his whole life was going to be his had been taken away. And he goes and he begs, is there just one? This plays into the story later because we live with this scarcity mentality as well. And Jesus addresses this in giving us the blessing of the firstborn. So this story has within it the key of fulfillment in family and life and the key of fulfillment in family life is the blessing that's part of being a family the grace that comes that that spans the gap between the idea and what's really real the first point I want to make is it has to do with craving blessing you see even though Jacob received this blessing he didn't receive any of the benefits of it he spent the rest of his life going from place to place. He eventually would have these 12 sons, and, and that'll come later in this series. But the truth is, what he got was the only thing he really wanted anyway. He didn't want the money. He just wanted the blessing. His brother had been the firstborn. His brother's the one who had been loved. His brother's the one who had been affirmed by his father. And so, as Jacob goes to his father, really all he wanted was he wanted this blessing of the firstborn to feel like it felt to be Esau. See, Jacob was saying to his dad, Dad, before you die, give me the attention and the love. Give me the affirmation that will let me know I matter to you. Dad, before you go, before you leave this world, let me know that I matter. Because you see, as we define blessing, the definition of blessing for this, this lesson today is pretty simple. When someone uniquely valuable to you demonstrates in a tangible way that you are uniquely valuable to them. That's blessing. When someone who is uniquely valuable to you defines and tells you that you are uniquely valuable valuable to them. Jacob spent his whole life craving blessing. 
If you go back to that verse that we just skipped over, Phil, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 26, uh, Jacob wrestles an angel all night long, and there's this battle uh, between the two of them. And at the end of the battle, the angel speaks to him and says, let me go for the dawn is breaking. And then Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you tell me that I have unique value. The problem is, is that Jacob was so desperate to receive blessing, and he had had blessing removed from him for so long that he was willing to do something that we should never ask someone in our family to do. He was willing to pretend to be something that he wasn't. You see, he, he craved this affirmation. He craved this, this relationship. He craved what he had never had because his brother had always had it. He craved to be like Esau and to experience that love and that affirmation and that, that value that he had given his son. And he was willing to become someone else in order to get that. And that's totally tragic. And we see it in our world all the time. We see it in our families all the time. You, you see sibling rivalry. Everybody wants to be first. All the kids want to be first in their mom's and their dad's eyes. You know, my, both my kids think Olivia's my favorite. She's here with me this morning. She is my favorite daughter. Sawyer's my favorite son. But you always have that sibling rivalry, you know, so they always want to jump in front of one another. Why? Because they want that blessing of the firstborn. We all have this need for affirmation. We all have this need to, to be told that we're valuable and that we're special. We see it in families. We see it in sibling rivalry. We see it at work. How many of you see people that you work with that will become some, somebody that they're really not just so that they can get attention of the boss? So they can jump in front and be the firstborn guy that gets the affirmation, the love, and the attention, and the value. We see it in, in families. Sometimes you'll see children choose occupations because it's what their dad did and it's what their dad's dad did. And, and they feel like in order to be that blessing and, and receive that blessing, get the value of the firstborn, they want to be that guy. You even see it in social media. Last weekend, my son was in town and uh, he and my wife and my daughter ran a 5K downtown for Oktoberfest. And my wife is a part of a group of friends that they like to run 5Ks, but they dress in goofy clothing to do it. So Sawyer thought my wife looked really goofy. She did. And he took a picture of it and put it on Instagram. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Instagram, but you take a picture of someone, you put it on Instagram, and then you wait for people to like your picture. And so we're sitting over lunch that day, or sitting over dinner that day, and Melissa says, well, I saw you put my picture on Instagram. How many likes did I get? affirmation well you got 22 likes well that's pretty good and Sawyer then said and I bet some of y'all have done this that's not good at all when I put something on Instagram if I don't get at least 200 likes I start calling people to tell them to like it <laughs> we want that affirmation we want that blessing we crave that in our lives and I have such empathy for Jacob because we read in, in Genesis 27 27 as he's receiving this blessing from his father it says so he came close and he kissed him and when he this is his father comes close to his son he kisses him and he smells the smell of his garments and he blessed him and said now before we go any further whose garments were Jacob wearing Esau's when he smelled the other brother, he says, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. And then I can just imagine he sees this look on his father's face. That look that he had been waiting for his whole life. He finally saw it. And the only problem is, it really wasn't for him. You know, sometimes when we lose ourselves in order to gain blessing, the blessing is hollow. And parents, when you, you force your children to change who they really are in order to receive your blessing, you're hurting your children. Children, be who you are. Your parents are going to love you. And it's just so sad that the first time that he saw that look on his father's face, it wasn't even really 
for him. I hope this story reminds us to bless our kids. That parents, make sure your children know. Because, you know, you're uniquely valued with the, valuable to them whether they say it or not. With my son, we have a, a going thing. I'll say, I love you. And he says, well, I can stand you. But, you know, people who are uniquely valuable, parents, you're uniquely valuable to your children. Make sure they know that they're uniquely valuable to you. Because we all crave blessing. For the health of your family. So what's real blessing? When it comes to us, what's real blessing? What of those people who are already at a point that their family's jacked up? What if, what if the people that are in a good family, but they continue to be someone else so that they can receive blessing? Where, where do we go from here? Where do we find real blessing? And when people will do this in order to crave that blessing and to get that blessing, when they'll become something they're not, it's a deeper spiritual problem that Jesus addressed. You see, the blessing in this story is the blessing of the firstborn. It's the blessing where God the Father says, you matter. And Jesus was the ultimate firstborn. Colossians chapter 1, we read verses 15, verses 18, and they say this, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. And then it tells us in verse 18, he is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, uh, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is the, the firstborn of the living, he is the firstborn of the dead. He is the ultimate firstborn in all ways. But here's what he did. He said, I have received that look from my father. I have received being pleased in front of my father, and what I want to do is I want to give that up and pass it on to you. I want you to know that, that that grace, that that affirmation, that that all of that blessing belongs to you. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read these words that Paul wrote. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And look what it says next. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. I want you to know, whoever you are, whatever family you're from, whether it's jacked up or it's great or whatever, you have someone that loves you and chose you to be, receive this blessing of the firstborn. I think of an amazing scene in Scripture. It's a scene where Jesus has found John the Baptist and he goes to him and he says, I want you to baptize me. John had been preaching, repent and be baptized. The Jews hated him because if you were a Jew, you didn't get baptized. You were already a Jew. And he's saying, you're not God's children enough. Repent and be baptized. And so Jesus comes to him and he asks to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And they go into the water. He's dipped in the water. He's raised out of the water and the heavens open up. And the Spirit of God comes down on the shoulders of Jesus like a dove, and then there's a voice. And Luke 3.22 tells us the voice said this, You are my beloved Son. In you, I'm well pleased. See, th this is one of the most powerful aspects of the gospel. Because through Jesus Christ and him giving us the blessing of the firstborn, what he's really done is this. Regardless of your family of origin, regardless if you came from a family who blessed you constantly or one that starved you for its blessing, regardless if you came from or part of a healthy or an unhealthy family, a functional or a dysfunctional family, regardless of all those things, Regardless of your mistakes, regardless of your past, the gospel tells you that you have a father that looks at you and says, my son, my daughter, my child, I 
You're valuable to me. And I am so pleased you're mine. Admit it. We're all jacked up. There's a reality of the ideal of God. There's the reality of who we are. And there's a huge gulf between them. But it's only the grace of Jesus Christ that spans that gulf. And because of who Jesus is, we have a God who looks at us and says, You're holy. You're pure. And you matter. This morning, I hope you know that God. I hope you come into a relationship with him. We believe that if you want to begin your journey with Jesus, you want to claim this inheritance, this blessing of the firstborn, we do it through baptism, being buried in water, raised new, as the emblem of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of you needed to hear this this morning. And you need to know that it's only when we actually can receive this kind of blessing that we become freed up to give blessing to others. So I pray you'll receive this blessing this morning.